I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Paul Jones, who runs two communities, the Fractional Executive Collective, an invitation-only community for exceptional fractionals with a track record of executive leadership focused on growing their fractional business. The Fractional Executive Collective started six months ago with 20 members currently and is actively defining and shaping the future of the fractional executive category. The second is the Fractional Executive Brain Trust, which is open to all fractionals and currently has over 1,000 members and has been running for two years. Paul is based in Lehigh, Utah. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for having me, Jay. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. We work with fractional executives to recreate their corporate income without the insane hours, building the business they want on their own terms. Jay Kingley, the co-founder and CEO of Maven, shares best practices along with tips and tricks on how you can build a robust pipeline to become fully booked with clients, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Enjoy today's episode. Paul, let's say I've had a 25-year career in finance, with my last two years serving as the CFO of a $500 million logistics business. I left corporate a year ago and established a business as a fractional CFO. I get introduced to you, and I want to understand what the Fractional Executive Collective is all about. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go! (laughs) Well, Jay, as a CFO just getting into your fractional business, you're probably getting some really nice referrals from past contacts. But the question is, how do you keep that business moving forward? And so I created the Fractional Executive Brain Trust for bona fide fractional executives to come together, play within their specialty, play within their niche, but also have a bench behind them of people that they can refer to. That's the collective part. So as a collective, fractional executives are bringing leads into their business, disqualifying most of them. But when you have a bench of people that are bona fide fractional executives that you can trust, those are people you can refer to. Paul. What motivated you to start this community? I mean, why do you do it? Well, um, I build, so with my company in general, we build strategic referral networks. And basically to, to you know summarize that, that's community as a go-to-market strategy. So one of my clients um, wanted to go after fractional executives. This was over two years ago. And I told them initially, hey, I've tried to build a consultant community before. It doesn't really work. Consultants generally look at each other as competitors. It's a scarcity in place. I don't think community is going to be a great option. And they said, well, we kind of want to do it anyway. And so we started. And the very first meeting that we ever had with fractional executives was one, really well attended. And two, whenever I kick off my brain trust meetings, when we bring a bunch of fractional executives together to talk about challenges and share best practices, I always talk about the abundance mindset. After I had talked about the abundance mindset, the chat exploded. People were like, yes, this is what what we do. And I was blown away. I knew that there was something different about fractional Mm -hmm. executives compared to traditional advisory firms, consulting firms, things like that. And so um, the, the community continued to grow and grow and grow. At the time, I had no idea how much growth we would start to see. Uh, fractional executive is, is a category that's growing very, very quickly. And so over the course of a year and a half to almost two years, I started having fractional executives come to me who have that leadership experience. And they started saying, hey, I love coming to your meeting and I love helping new people out, but there's not really a place where I as a fractional executive with leadership, true leadership, executive leadership background experience can talk and meet other fractional executives with leadership experience. And so that's when the Fractional Executive Collective started was um, the members just generally coming to me and saying, hey, this would be really nice to have. And I, at that point, I had done... Uh, a couple hundred phone calls with fractional executives. So I really started to understand the the motion of the business. And and I felt that there was a need there that we could really, really hone in on uh, from a community perspective. So um, long story short, it's it's one of my favorite 
communities that I've ever built. It's, it's an incredible space with a lot of really incredible people. I talk to a lot of fractionals about the challenge that they have in building their business. And one of the things that I talk to them about are marketing channels. And I always ask them, what channels are you using? And typically, you know, you'll hear LinkedIn. You'll hear I go to random networking events. I join random networking groups. But I think community as a go-to-market channel for these types of fractional executives has to be at the very top of the list of the things they should be doing to build their business. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that the, you know, community is a buzzword right now, but what does that actually mean? And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a shift in how companies, consultancies, whatever brands, engage with their potential personas. In the past, it was, what's your value proposition? And for mm-hmm. sure, we need to have our value proposition. We need to know what pains we solve. But I, the, the, the idea of community is, hey, yes, we as a company solve these pains. But for you as a persona, we're more interested in your overall success than we are in just servicing these pains. We know these pains are going to come up at some point. So that's fine. We'll be here for that when that happens. But we want to really understand you as a persona. We really want to get into your voice. We really want to understand what you, what the challenges that you go through, things like that. And so when you approach this more holistic viewpoint of your customer, um, that opens up the door for all kinds of opportunities, not just your service, but also partnerships with other companies, partnerships with other fractionals where when you put the need of your customer first, now you're able to build trust with them by connecting them with people that are going to move the needle for them in the pain that they're experiencing at that moment, which again, might not be the pain that directly relates to your service or product. So I think that's the idea behind community is more of a holistically helping your customer. I really like that, Paul, because one of the things that surprises executives that have left corporate and are now setting up their own business where more or less they are acting solo is how lonely it is. Mm. And as we like to say, being a solo fractional executive is a team sport. And the only way you're going to go from solo to team is by becoming part of a community where you really resonate and fit. So that that brings up the question, what would be the benefits I would get as a fractional executive for becoming part of your community? It's a good question. Um, I think one of the biggest benefits is that it's a vetted group. So when I say bona fide leadership, I really mean you have to have uh, executive long-term leadership. Now, inside our group, we have people that have global leadership. We have people that are um, you know, US-based, uh, so not necessarily global. But the, the point of it is that you've seen a lot of things. And, and the reason why we vet so uh, close or we, we vet so carefully is because a good fractional executive is really good at getting to the root cause of their clients or prospects problems. And so when you, so so one, the vetting is, is really important because now I've got a community of people that are really, really good at finding root cause problems. Um, And then two, the other thing that we, the other value proposition here that we do is we create a space where these are people that are committed to shaping and forming the future of work. I, I actually think, and I believe that fractional executives are the tip of the spear as it relates to the future of work. Uh, you have this huge emerging industry and people are running their practices in all kinds of different ways. I, I mean, the, um, the difference in models that I've seen from just our fractional executive collective is incredible. So being able to hop in and learn other models on how people are growing and scaling their businesses, how they're maintaining fractional, have conversations about what fractional means, what, uh, what your SOWs look like. You really get to share best practices with other people that are that are doing it well um, and and are committed to continuing to grow with fractional executives. So one, vetted. Two, you get to share best practices. Um, three, the other thing that I think is really important is 
in all the phone calls that I did with my fractional executive brain trust, the bigger group, I learned that a majority of fractional executives are disqualifying their prospects that they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. And you've talked about this before, Jay, and, and uh, your whole thing is this is your your second motion. Well, when it's your second motion, you get to be a little bit more picky about who you work with, right? So um, fractional executives really are, one, more picky about who they're going to work with, and two, they're really looking for clients they can move the needle on. And that's going to disqualify a lot of clients that you talk to. However, I think that the prospecting call, that prospecting experience, is really, really important and provides a lot of value. So again, if you have a bench of people behind you, we the collective is all about identifying the needs of the client and then referring the client to the proper fractional executive that's going to be able to move the needle for them. And what I love about that is that everyone wins. The, the client is going to win. The, refer, the person referring is going to win. Um, And then the person doing the work is going to win as well. And that, I think, is a recipe for significant success. And that's what's going to differentiate, I think, fractional executives. If if we do this well, um, we will we will absolutely move quicker than we could have because. We're, we're actually getting results on a regular basis. So I know there's a lot of discussion out there. Do you niche down? Do you generalize? I'm a fan of niching down because as a system becomes more complex, um, specialty becomes more important. So knowing what your specialty is, I've always said you could put five CMOs in a room and they would all either serve different industries, different size companies, or do different parts of marketing in general. So Really, in the fractional executive space, you get the chance to play within your specialty where you know you can move the needle very confidently, um, but also build relationships with people that others might think are competitors when they really aren't. They, they could be an, an amazing referral partner for you. And it all comes down to how good can you take someone through the qualifying process and get down to the root cause of their problem and what they need. I think another thing that... Uh adds and augments what you're saying is that those who do the prospecting and the buying process the best are those that have a mindset of what would I do if I were in the seat of the prospect? Having a community that has a much broader bench that allows you to both give and receive clients that are a much better fit is, Mm -hmm. as you say, an enormous advantage. But Paul, let's go even a little bit deeper. Now, there are a lot of communities out there that fractionals can join and and seemingly new ones are popping up every day. What makes the Fractional Executive Collective different from all the others? Uh, So this is where things get really fun. Now, one of the first rules of community management is that you never assume what your community is going to want. And when I first started this out, I was like, okay, I got to remember that rule. And what's come out of this group is thought leadership. Now, I I knew that we wanted to do thought leadership because if I'm spending the effort vetting the group good and well enough, um, they're going to be ballers and they're going to be people that are really passionate about fractional executive as the future of work. I didn't know where that was going to take us. And where that's taken us has been, um, we actually released thought leadership articles around what a fractional executive is, why you should hire fractional executives, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea, again, behind the collective is, is that as a collective, we can generate content catered to potential prospects and clients, bring them into the collective and share them amongst each other. So the model that that I'm trying to build here is like the antithesis of the typical brokerage model. We don't, as a as the fractional executive collective, we don't take any anything for new clients that we bring in because collectively we're generating thought leadership pieces and we're putting them out there um, as a group to bring them back into the fractional executive collective. So it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of discussions. We're in Google Docs a lot. Um, everyone that contributes inside of our our thought leadership pieces is is uh, attributed as a contributor on that, and uh, and it's been a lot of fun. So I think that's probably the biggest differentiator is 
we're truly a collective. I mean, that's what we live by. Uh, you, I'm not going to bring you leads and, and I'm not going to take a percentage of those. We're working together to bring people in almost like a DAO. Um, it, it, that's kind of where we're going is, again, the opposite of a brokerage account. How can we work together to better fit the needs of clients out there? And I think that's where the real opportunity is. I've gone to a lot of um, tech events with with you know, uh, early stage founders. And I've asked, do you know what a fractional executive is? And broadly, a lot of people really don't know what that is yet. So you have a lot of people coming into the space, into the fractional executive as a fractional executive space. But you also have a lot of market education that needs to happen. And so that's what we're really kind of focused on right now. That's one, that's one element of... I'd say that's our biggest differentiator is you get a bunch of really awesome people together and you say, hey, what can we do? What can we put out there? What are some thought leadership pieces? What, what does the market need to understand? You know, um, so those are those are things that we're constantly working on. I really resonate with that. One of the things that I challenge every fractional that I work with is to say you are either in the business of selling your time for money or selling your brain for value. And if you want to sell your brain for value, that is all about your intellectual property. And the way that you are going to communicate that is through thought leadership. So, Paul, bang on uh, in terms of that key differentiator. Now, given that you engage with so many different fractional executives, can you share your perspective on the biggest challenges facing fractionals today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in the fractional executive brain trust, which again, that's the community that any any fractional executive can join. We meet once a month. Uh, we gather for an hour. I put you into breakout rooms. You you meet other fractional executives. We generally tackle a problem or a challenge. So for two years, I've been ask, asking fractional executives, just surveying them in general, what's the biggest challenge that you face? And of course, with any consulting business or with any um, w- with any solopreneur type business where you're going out and finding leads and bringing them in, et cetera, you're going to be experiencing the wave, right? Uh, and so every single month, it's how do I get more clients? How do I manage my clients? And things that are related basically to sales. Um, so I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge. Now, one of the things that I notice with fractional executives are if you just get into the fractional executive work, if you're just getting into it, you get this really nice wave. Like you change. Mm-hmm. I hear this all the time. Uh, I changed my LinkedIn profile to fractional executive. And all of a sudden I got five hits. And for the newbie fractional executive, you're like, oh, this is butter. This is awesome. I don't have to do anything. This is great. The thing is, is it's a wave. It is not consistent. You're going to get this beautiful, nice wave. So you get this perfect uplift. You surf that for a little bit. But if you're not ready to go catch the next wave, your business is going to flounder for a little bit. And you have to be ready for that. So I think um, you have to be strategic in how you're going to market as a fractional executive in the beginning and recognize, okay, the, the clients that I'm going to get initially is not how I'm going to get my future clients. So What's something that I can do to sustain uh, opportunities that come my way in the future? And I think that if you ask any fractional executive out there, it's all referrals. It's a referral-based business. And there's a lot of people out there will be like, well, you know, you have to do advertising. You have to do... I I really don't think that's the case. Referral-based businesses, if you're really good, you will continue to get more and more referrals. And it can be a consistent opportunity generator for you. So I think you really have to think about um, the partnerships that you make, uh, referral partnerships that you make. You have to be conscientious of how you treat people that refer business to you. Um, One of our members uh, says it the best. He says, never screw over a person that refers someone to you ever. Because that is how you grow, consistently grow your business is people have to trust you and what you're doing and the results that you can achieve. Um, so yeah, Jay, I'd say, uh, the biggest questions are just how do I keep my, how do I maintain a consistent pipeline as I'm getting into this business? That's the number one problem. 
Paul, that matches what I hear all the time. The biggest pain point that a fractional will have is an inconsistent pipeline. And mm -hmm. the challenge is, how do I go from inconsistent to robust? And I love your analogy of a wave. I think a lot of fractionals get fooled and say, wow, this is pretty easy. So I don't have to worry about it. But boy, that wave doesn't last forever. And now they, they have a real challenge ahead of themselves. So you, you've talked a little bit about this, but what have you learned from your community that you didn't know when you started? Well, I, I did talk a little bit about this, but I think it, it, uh, it's important to mention again that one, fractional executives are doing something that I think truly is the future of work. And the future of work is being able to work for multiple companies doing something that you're really, really good at. Um, so what's awesome about that is you have to really be good at communicating how you move the needle and exactly what needles you move, first of all. Um, but the thing that I was surprised to learn in the space was mostly that uh, there's such an opportunity for one, fractional executives already have the mindset. They already have the abundance mindset. They're ready to partner. Two, they're disqualifying most of the people that they bring in. So those two things combined by themselves creates a really interesting system that we can build on to create new models of business, I think. So that's been the biggest thing. And that's what gets me so excited about the Fractional Executive Collective is we get to approach how we gain business in a different way. And it's a more organic way. You know, um, a lot of times when people invest in advertising, they expect a six to 10 X on, on uh, investment. The tricky thing about referrals is, is it's really hard to get that kind of predictability. Um, but I think that right now I can't say we have that, but in the future, I think that can be possible. Um, as long as you have those two ingredients inside a system, abundance mindset, and uh, a lot of people are disqualifying the leads that they're bringing in, this enables an opportunity for people to do matching. And at the end of the day, that's really what sales are. Sales is about matching. It's well, one, identifying the true pain, and then two, matching that pain to the, pr the proper solution. So you have this audience of people that are really good at doing that. Now it's a matter of creating and building these, these networks that allow you that allow information to move easily across the network um, and also enable people to build it. So when we talk about network optimization, things like that, like those are the things that, that I actually get really excited about because I think all the basic ingredients are are in fractional executive in the fractional executive world. Um, so that's uh, th that's kind of an overview. Some of the things I was surprised and and also very excited about. Now, based on your experience and the learnings and some of the uh, insight that you've shared with us so far, what advice would you give to a fractional executive? At least from what I see, again, your relationships are the most important things that you're going to have, um, and so it's really important to understand. Your network when and, and I think most fractional executives get this. I'll, I'll give you a great example, Jay. In the fractional executive collective, we had someone co um, come and speak. She does network analysis for individuals. So, and this is this is the next wave of sales. So, a lot of you out there have probably heard. You know, we've all heard outbound. We've all heard inbound. There's a new term coming out called nearbound, and nearbound is about what are the relationships that are near to me. And, and how do those relationships, that constellation of relationships and the affinity of those relationships, how do those, how do those impact my business? So when you look as a fractional executive at your nearbound opportunities, meaning what net, what's, your, what's your most closely, um, what are your closest relationships inside your, your personal network? When you analyze those relationships, you find, you know, four different profiles. But the ones that are the most interesting is you're going to find people that aren't direct business to you, but refer business over to you. So advocates. So these are advocates that um, they're, they're going to be out there. I'm looking at my inbox right now. And uh, I, there's an amazing member of our fractional executive brain trust. I think he probably introduces me to 10 other fractional executives on a monthly basis. 
not a direct customer, but bringing in a lot of different people. It's these kinds of mechanics inside of a network where I think there's the biggest opportunity, where in the past, everyone's always just said networking, 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 but we haven't gotten very scientific about analyzing our networks and looking at our networks and understanding how our networks interplay with our business. Um, and so, like I had mentioned, we brought on a speaker, Chelsea Harding. She's great. She's the uh, CEO of Grow Together. She actually sits down and analyzes your network and determines, okay, who are your advocates? Who are your direct customers? What are the, what's the affinity relationships? And then from there, you develop a go-to-market plan on how how you're going to use your network, leverage your network, utilize it um, to actually go to market. And that's where I think there's a lot of opportunity right now and and where we're going to be seeing a lot of um, new ways of thinking about this near bound motion. And I think fractional executives fit right in there. Paul, you've articulated a very compelling value proposition for your community. So for all those that are interested, what does it cost to become a member? So the Fractional Executive Brain Trust is free. So anyone that wants to come to our monthly mastermind meetings, essentially, uh, you can reach out to me. I'll add you into that group. It's, it's an awesome group. We have a lot of fun. And then the Fractional Executive Collective is $300 a month. Um, and, and we are currently at our 20 founding members right now. So they're shaping out the ecosystem of what we're going to build on in the future. We'll actually start accepting general cohort membership in uh, Q1 of 2024. Right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Paul. As a fractional executive, you work with us to help you recreate your corporate income without working the insane hours. Our fractional flywheel service focuses on how to price, package, and position your years of experience and expertise, create and refine your go-to-market strategy so it's effective and efficient, and then nail your execution. Working with us, you will build a robust pipeline to become fully booked, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Maven's unique fractional catalyst service for those serving startups and early stage companies gets you acting like a venture capitalist in managing your business and as an entrepreneur when working with your clients. Achieve financial security and reward with clients who want you to take charge, ask for forgiveness, not permission, in an environment without all the politics and bureaucracy you find in corporate. Email j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com to learn more. Welcome back. We're talking to Paul Jones, the founder of the Fractional Executive Collective, a by invitation only community serving all flavors of fractionals. Paul, let's find out a bit more about you. Let me start with what's your biggest professional accomplishment? Uh, great question, Jay. I think one as an entrepreneur, the funnest thing you can do is it's a long and lonely road to quote the Beatles. I, when I was first uh, moving into entrepreneurship, I was coming from the outdoor industry. And uh, my wife was going to grad school in Omaha, Nebraska. And I had bought this windsurf windsurfing board. So I come from a guiding background. I was a river guide in Jackson, Wyoming for a really long time. And then it, during college and things like that, I was in, the, in just outdoor guide industry type situation. Uh, moved to Omaha, Nebraska, and I bought this huge windsurfing board. Paddleboarding was really big at the time; like it was, it was really becoming really popular in California and so forth. And um, I didn't have the money to to buy a paddleboard, uh, so I I bought this old windsurfer for fifty bucks. I went to one of the lakes out there, and I I, I was using like a kayak paddle just to kind of paddle around, and uh, cars were were pulling over, stopping. To, to watch me paddleboard. And I was, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, because coming from Utah, everyone kind of knew what paddleboarding was, but I realized out there, no one knows what it was. No one knew what it was. Uh, so at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a paddleboarding company. And I really didn't know a lot about starting a business. I, I didn't go to business school. And I put the first... I put all of the all of the capital expenditure, everything on a credit card. I had found this credit card that was interest free for two years. I maxed that thing out. I bought paddleboards, I bought paddles, I bought life jackets, I bought a trailer, I bought all this stuff. 
I was very lucky because I had a mentor um, who did teach at the business school that I had happened to meet. And she told me, Paul, you need to make a business plan. So that I did do. And in the course of that business plan, I realized the business I thought I was going to build is not the business that I needed to build. And so I ended up switching, put all of my, all of my inventory on credit card, had a marketing plan. I was really fortunate enough to also have another mentor in marketing who had a very unique way of marketing, implemented that marketing plan, put all the money on, on our credit card. My wife was freaking out because we didn't have any money. And uh, within two months, had paid off the credit card, uh, was in the black and was running, running the paddleboarding business. So I ran that business for about three years, um, sold it to an amazing, amazing person in that area. It's still running today. It's something I'm, I'm really uh, proud of because I really didn't know what I was doing. And luckily enough, I had a lot of great mentors to help me along the way there. I want to be fair and balanced. So now what's your biggest professional failure? But more importantly, what did you learn from it? How did it shape what you do today? Yes. Oh, man. You know, when you first get into uh, a career, you are going to learn a lot. And so I, I um, was working in a SaaS startup and I, uh, I, I was a leader in that SaaS startup. I had a lot of people reporting up to me and I botched it. Like my whole life, leadership had come so easily. And I thought, oh, yeah, I, this just comes naturally. I know what I'm doing. But I got my ass kicked in business, like straight up. People did not like me. I, I didn't manage the team very well. Um, I looked back on that after I had left that opportunity. It took me a couple of years to like gather myself back and be like, all right, man, you can go back into this. You, you can do this. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons. So the biggest failure, I think, was leading people which is not so easy, um, which turns out, you know, sh should have guessed that. But I learned a lot of great lessons about uh, setting expectations, um, how, you know, I really like the OKR framework as a result of that. I really like uh, setting, you know, the mission and vision and, and constantly communicating that with people. Um, so I've, I've, I've come back from that, but it was a, it was a bug kicker for a while. Like it, it, it took out my confidence for a while. It was hard. Um, but it was the best lesson I could have learned, I think in the most humbling way. Well, failure is only failure if you fail to learn. And as you know, Paul, education is never free. So <laughs> yeah, but it's comes at a often cost. worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. Indeed. Uh, Paul, any regrets? Oh man. So regrets. There's, there's always this one regret that surfaces. It's always there. I don't have a lot of regrets, really, truly. But I do have a regret of when I was eight years old. Um, and, I, and I should have realized that I was going to be in business at this point. But this was another big regret that I had. So everyone does a lemonade stand when they're eight. And I didn't want to do a lemonade stand, but I wanted to make a little extra money. So I took $5. I had $5. I rode my bike to the grocery store and I bought, uh, you know what? I, I had calculated to, on a two liter bottle of Sprite and a two liter bottle of Mountain Dew. This is how many cups I would need to sell to double my money. It was all about doubling my money, right? So I, I took that five bucks. I bought a packet of country, country time lemonade and a two liter bottle of Sprite and a two liter bottle of Mountain Dew. And at the time in my community, Mountain Dew was the bad drink. Like only the rebels drink Mountain Dew. And my mom was not excited when I showed home with the Mountain Dew. She was like, that is not going to be in our house. That will not be in our fridge. So you better hope that you sell that whole thing out there. So I went out on a Saturday, early Saturday morning. I set up my lemonade stand. I had my traditional lemonade. I had my Sprite. I had my Mountain Dew. And I probably sold three cups of lemonade. It was a hard day. And I remember the newspaper boy uh, he lived just down the street from me. He was just starting his newspaper route. And he came over and he saw the Mountain Dew. And he was like, hey, I'll give you five bucks for that Mountain Dew, for that two liters of Mountain Dew. He was about to do like a two hour newspaper route. So you could tell he's thinking like, oh, it'd be nice to have, you know, a two liter Mountain Dew while I'm doing my newspaper route. And I did the calculations in my head. I was like, well, that's just breaking even. I'm, I want to make more money. So I told him no. 
So he goes on his newspaper route. He's gone for two hours. You know, he, he's leaving with the newspaper bag totally filled up and, and he's a little bummed or whatever. And, and he leaves for two hours. The sun's going down. My mom's like, you need to come inside, but you can't bring that with you. So I'm like, how am I going to sell the money I need to make to break even on my Mountain Dew in 30 minutes? Well, the, the newspaper boy finishes, he comes back around and I flag him down. I'm like, hey, I'll sell you that Mountain Dew now. And he's like, I don't want it. And I'm like, what do you mean? You, you know, I'll sell it to you for five bucks. That's what you said. He's like, yeah, but you know, I don't really want it. And I was like, well, shoot, I can't take this into my house. So I ended up giving, I was like, well, fine, just, just take it. So I, I give it to him and I'll never forget. He's riding back to his house. He undoes the, the top on the mountain and he's just pouring it into the gutter as he's going home. <laughs> and... That is my my regret is that when you have the birds in the hand, you got to take advantage of them. And and uh, I, I should have sold it to him when it was needed. So it's all about lining up in the right moment at the right time. And I failed to recognize that. Well, the entrepreneurial journey is often long, but it always starts with the first step. I love your first step. And yes, Mountain Dew can be very nasty. <laughs> All right, Paul, what's next for you and the collective over the coming 12 months? Uh, we are probably going to be working on a book um, and we will be pushing out a lot of content. So watch for that. What's the best way for our audience to contact you? Reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, Paul Jones 101. Uh, you can search for me there. Uh, you can also reach out on our website, fractionalexecutivecollective.com. Uh, and check us out there. If you want to join the Fractional Executive Brain Trust, which again is the free uh, community, um, you can just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to add you to that uh, calendar invite. And then if you're interested in the Fractional Executive Collective, uh, you can go to fractionalexecutivecollective.com. We will put uh, that information in our show notes for both the podcast and the video. And be sure to reach out to Paul. Paul, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcasts on all the major platforms and our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and your family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. <laughs>